Hello everyone, welcome to the 225 Literary and Jury Charge. Today we're going to start off with some continuation from the evolution of the Jerry Brudos Fatal Shoe Fetish. Um, and this is from some of the psychologists that evaluated him. Okay, here we go. Jerry Brudos, it must be remembered, was still a prepubescent boy. If abuse permanently fuses in the child's subconscious, they can become fetishes or paraphilias such as masochism or sadism, necrophilia, and so forth that the child will carry with him into adulthood. Psychologists are unsure what causes such a fusing in some children, but in the case of Brudos, it might have been his mother's hysterical reaction to his bringing home a pair of high-heeled shoes. Whatever feelings he might or she might have had at that moment or whatever feelings he might have had at that moment could have become fused with guilt, rage, and unrequited desire for the rest of his life. The unfortunate events that followed in his childhood could have prevented him from ever growing out of it. I do not want to make any kind of value judgment here on gender issues or alternative lifestyles or on what is normal or abnormal, healthy or unhealthy. Let us say for the sake of argument that basic normal development will lead a child and adolescent to gradually discover increasing degrees of affectionate contact with the opposite sex. If this development, however, is sidetracked or short-circuited, short the individual seeks affectionate relationships by focusing on areas that were fused to his or her memories in childhood. These become fetishes or paraphilias, narrowly focused on obsessions with their inanimate objects or particular types of partners or activities that often exclude the enjoyment of relationships in any other form. It also appears to be predominantly a male problem. Paraphilias are often accompanied by deep shame, so deep that sometimes the offender finds it less shameful to kill the victim than to admit to a paraphiliac desire. Sometimes these associations are minor and harmless and simply limit the individual and his relationship to the opposite sex. They become expressed as preferences for long-legged women or for women with a certain body type, color of hair, scent, voice, and so forth. Other times, these paraphilias are more extensive. For example, a surprisingly common paraphilia among otherwise heterosexual males approaching middle age is a desire for a relationship with transsexuals, males who appear to be women. In many countries, Entire neighborhoods are sometimes dedicated exclusively to prostitutes of this category. Why? Most likely the normal urge of some males toward the opposite sex is a short-circuited by their ignorance of female anatomy, especially if they have no female siblings in the family or have not been exposed to full female frontal nudity in life or in pictorial form to which many males growing up prior to the 1970s would not have been readily exposed. Instead, the male child fills in his imagination with what he knows best, his own body. He imagines the female form with the fuses of this imagery with his earliest relationships. What happens next, of course, remains a mystery. Upon discovering the true form of female genitals, some males react with aversion, while others decide that what women really have is even better than what they imagined and go from there. Others, however, continue to associate an intense desire with their childhood memory of women with male counterparts. Paraphilias are powerful because they are so often linked to a primal awakening that is frequently not even understood, but more of an overwhelming mystery. Some individuals spend the rest of their lives chasing these dragons that they experienced in childhood, never coming close to replicating the original memory. In some cases, these associations are severe and debilitating and sometimes dangerous to others. They can be fused with sadistic or necrophiliac tendencies or with rage and humiliation, especially in individuals who were abused as children. 
even harmless paraphilias can be given a dangerous edge under certain circumstances. Jerry Brudos had no opportunity for a healthy social environment and development, and his almost comic shoe fetish became a motive for horrific murders. While in others, a fetish for shoes would be a harmless quirk, in Brudos it was streaked with feelings of hate, rejection, betrayal, anger, and frustration toward women. Brutus was a walking time bomb as he staggered into puberty, and it only got worse. Okay, so we're going to stop there. There is more, but I will read more of that in the next class. I'm going to read some jury charge, and this will be at 200, and then I'm going to reread it again at 225. Okay, ready? Members of the jury, evidence may be either direct or circumstantial. It is direct evidence if it proves without an inference and which in itself, if true, conclusively establishes that fact. If it is circumstantial evidence, if it proves a fact from which an inference of the existence of another fact may be drawn, an inference is a deduction of fact that may logically and reasonably be drawn from another fact or group of facts, established by the evidence. The law makes no distinction between direct and circumstantial evidence as to the degree of proof required. Each is accepted as a reasonable method of proof, and each is respected for such convincing forces as it may carry. The court may take judicial notice of certain facts or events. When the court declares it will take judicial notice of some fact or event, you may accept the court's declaration as evidence and regard as proved the fact or event which has been judicially noticed, but you are not required to do so since you are the sole judges of the facts. Okay, so I'm going to reread that again, but at 225. Ready? Here we go. Members of the jury, evidence may be either direct or circumstantial. It is direct evidence if it proves without an inference in which in itself, if true, conclusively establishes that fact. It is circumstantial evidence if it proves a fact from which an inference of the existence of another fact may be drawn. An inference is a deduction of fact that may logically and reasonably be drawn from another fact or group of facts established by the evidence. The law makes no distinction between direct and circumstantial evidence as to the degree of proof required. Each is accepted as a reasonable method of proof and each is respected for such convincing forces as it may carry. The court may take judicial notice of certain facts or events. When the court declares it will take judicial notice of some fact or event, you may accept the court's declaration as evidence and regard as proved the fact or event which has been judicially noticed, but you are not required to do so since you are the sole judges of the facts. Okay. I'm going to read a segment from Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, and this is called Imagine Yourself at Your Own Funeral. Ready? This strategy is a little scary for some people, but universally effective at reminding us of what's in the most important thing in our lives. When we look back on our lives, how many of us are going to be pleased at how uptight we were? Almost universally, when people look back on their lives while on their deathbed, they wish that their priorities had been quite different. With few exceptions, people wish they hadn't sweated the small stuff so much. Instead, they wish they had spent more time with the people and activities that they truly loved and less time worrying about aspects of life that upon deeper examination really don't matter all that much. Imagining yourself at your own funeral allows you to look back at your life while you still have the chance to make some important changes. While it can be a little scary or painful, it's a good idea to consider your own death and in the process, your life. Doing so will remind you of the kind of person you want to be and the priorities that are most important to you. If you're at all like me, you'll probably get a wake-up call that can be an excellent source of change. All right. I've got a stipulation to relieve the court reporter. Okay, here we go. Okay, let's go ahead and relieve the reporter of her duties under the Code of Civil Procedure regarding custody and signature of the original deposition transcript 
The original will be forwarded directly to Mr. Pollard. Mr. Pollard will maintain the original and make it available at all subsequent proceedings. Mr. Pollard will make the original deposition transcript available to Kyle via his guardian ad litem for review and signature under penalty of perjury via the guardian ad litem. Mr. Pollard will notify all other counsel of any changes, revisions, or corrections made by the guardian ad litem as she reads it to and or with Kyle within 60 days of Mr. Pollard's receipt of the original. Should the original become lost, misplaced, or otherwise unavailable, or should the guardian ad litem not read it, then a copy will be used as the original. Okay, so I'm going to read this one more time, but I'm going to read that at 225. Okay, here we go, ready? Okay, go ahead and relieve the reporter of her duties under the Code of Civil Procedure regarding custody and signature of the original deposition transcript. The original will be forwarded directly to Mr. Pollard. Mr. Pollard will maintain the original and make it available at all subsequent proceedings. Mr. Pollard will make the original deposition transcript available to Kyle via his guardian ad litem for review and signature under penalty of perjury via the guardian ad litem. Mr. Pollard will notify all other counsel of any changes, revisions, or corrections made by the guardian ad litem as she reads it to and or with Kyle within 60 days of Mr. Pollard's receipt of the original. Should the original become lost, misplaced, or otherwise unavailable, or should the guardian ad litem not read it, then and a copy will be used as the original. All right. I'm going to read from Awaken the Giant Within. Here we go. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth that the movement, one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. If making decisions is so simple and powerful, then why don't more people follow Nike's advice with just do it? I think one of the simplest reasons is that most of us don't recognize what it even means to make a real decision. We don't recognize the force of change that a congruent, committed decision creates. Part of the problem is that for so long, most of us have used the term decision so loosely that it's come to describe something like a wish list. Instead of making decisions, we keep stating preferences. Making a true decision, unlike saying I'd like to quit smoking, is cutting off any other possibility. Making a true decision means committing to achieving a result and then cutting yourself off from any other possibility. When you truly decide you'll never smoke cigarettes again, that's it. It's over. You no longer even consider the possibility of smoking. If you're one of the people who's ever exercised the power of decision this way, you know exactly what I'm talking about. An alcoholic knows that even after years of absolute sobriety, if he fools himself into thinking that he can take even one drink, he'll have to begin all over again. After making a true decision, even a tough one, most of us feel a tremendous amount of relief. We've finally gotten off the fence, and we all know how great it feels to have a clear, unquestioned objective. This kind of clarity gives you power. With clarity, you can produce the results that you really want for your life. The challenge for most of us is that we haven't made a decision in so long, we've forgotten what it feels like. We've got flabby decision-making muscles. Some people even have a hard time deciding what they're going to have for dinner. So how do we strengthen those muscles? Give them a workout. The way to make better decisions is to make more of them. Then make sure you learn from each one, including those that don't seem to work out in the short term. They will provide valuable distinctions to make better evaluations and therefore decisions in the future. Realize that decision-making, like any skill you focus on improving, gets better the more often you do it. The more often you make decisions, the more you'll realize that you truly are in control of your life. You'll look forward to future challenges, and you'll see them as an opportunity to make new distinctions and move your life to the next level. I can't overemphasize the power and value of gaining even one single distinction, a sole piece of information that can be used to change the course of your life. 
Information is power when it's acted upon, and one of my criteria for a true decision is that action flows from it. The exciting thing is that you never know when you're going to get it. The reason I read over 700 books, listen to tapes, and went to so many seminars is that I understood the power of a single distinction. It might be on the next page or in the next chapter of this book. It might even be something you already know. But for some reason, this is the time it finally sinks in and you begin to use it. Remember that repetition is the mother of skill. Distinctions empower us to make better decisions and therefore create the results that we desire for ourselves. Not having certain distinctions can cause you major pain. For example, many of the most famous people in our culture have achieved, achieved their dreams but have still not found a way to enjoy them. They often turn to drugs because they feel unfulfilled. This is because they are missing the distinction between achieving one's goals and living one's values. So another distinction that many people don't have causes pain in their relationships on a regular basis. It's a rules distinction. Sometimes not having a certain distinction can cause you everything. People who run strenuously yet continue to eat fatty foods are clogging up their arteries and, of course, and then having heart attacks. For most of my life, I've pursued what the famed business expert Dr. W. Edwards Deming calls profound knowledge. To me, profound knowledge is any simple distinction, strategy, belief, skill, or tool that the minute we understand it, we can apply it to make immediate increases in the quality of our lives. This book and my life have been committed to pursuing profound knowledge that has universal application to improving our personal and professional lives. I'm constantly figuring out how to communicate this knowledge with people in ways that truly empower them to improve their mental, emotional, physical, and financial destinies. It is in your moments of decision that your destiny is shaped. From Anthony Robbins, that is so true. Three decisions that you make every moment of your life to control your destiny. These are three decisions that determine what you'll notice, how you'll feel, what you'll do, and ultimately what you will contribute and who you will become. If you don't control these three decisions, you simply aren't in control of your life. When you do control them, you begin to sculpt your experience. The three decisions that control your destiny are, number one, your decision about what to focus on. Number two, your decision about what things mean to you. Number three, your decisions about what to do to create the results you desire. You see, it's not what's happening to you now or what has happened in your past that determines who you become. Rather, it's your decision about what to focus on, what things mean to you, and what you're going to do about them that will determine your ultimate destiny. Know that if anyone is enjoying greater success than you in any area, they're making these three decisions differently from you in some context or situation. Clearly, Ed Roberts chose to focus on something different than most people in his position would. He focused on how he could make a difference. His physical difficulties meant challenge to him. What he decided to do, clearly, was anything that could make the quality of his life for others in his position more comfortable. He absolutely committed himself to shaping the environment in a way that would improve the quality of life for all physically challenged people. I know of more encouraging facts than the unquestionable ability of man to elevate his life by a conscious endeavor. Too many of us don't make the majority of our decisions con consciously, especially these three absolutely crucial ones. In so doing, we pay a major price. In fact, most people live what I call the Niagara Syndrome. I believe that life is like a river and that most people jump on the river of life without really deciding where they want to end up. So in a short period of time, they get caught up in the current. Current events, current fears, current challenges. When they come to forks in the river, they don't consciously decide where they want to go or which is the right decision for them. They merely go with the flow. They become a part of the mass of people who are directed 
by the environment instead of by their own values. As a result, they feel out of control. They remain in this unconscious state until one day the sound of the raging water awakens them and they discover that they're five feet from Niagara Falls in a boat with no oars. At this point, they say, oh no, but by then it's too late. They are going to take a fall. Sometimes it's an emotional fall. Sometimes it's a physical fall. Sometimes it's a financial fall. It's likely that whatever challenges you have in your life currently could have been avoided by some better decisions upstream. How do we turn things around if we're caught up in the momentum of the raging river? Either make a decision to put both oars in the water and start paddling like a crazy person in a new direction, or decide to plan ahead, set a course for where you really want to go, and have a plan or map so that you can make quality decisions along the way. Although you may never have even thought about it, your brain has already constructed an internal system for making decisions. This system acts like an invis invisible force, directing all of your thoughts, actions, and feelings, both good and bad, every moment that you live. It controls how you evaluate everything in your life, and it's largely driven by your subconscious mind. The scary thing is that most people never consciously set this system up. Instead, it's been installed through the years by sources as diverse as parents, peers, teachers, television, advisors, advertisers, and the culture at large. The system is comprised of five components. Number one, your core beliefs and unconscious rules. Number two, your life values. Number three, your references. Number four, the habitual questions that you ask yourself. And number five, the emotional states you experience in each moment. Okay, that concludes our literary and jury charge for the day. You have a wonderful day.